Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And uh, if you, again, if you are new to us, uh, we are in a series of uh, messages that we're just calling Exiles, going right through First Peter, and shortly we'll be into Second Peter, and it's how he addressed these first century Christians who had been uh, greatly persecuted for their faith. They have become exiles, which is the same word in English as sojourner, alien, foreigner. Uh, in other words, uh, in this world, you are a round peg and this is a square hole. So you're the one that don't belong. And uh, he's addressing them as they're going through all of these things. So uh, last weekend, I spoke to you on the title uh, covering the previous verses of chapter 4 uh, of Time Flies. And time flies, the first point of that was when you get older, time flies, right? Peter is an aged man. He realizes in one of the verses uh, in the previous uh, verses here, it says the end of all things is at hand. Uh, and in his life, he knew that Jesus had told him when he's older, he's going to be crucified. And so he knew his time was also at hand. And really, in um, our day, we say this about time flies. Time flies when you're having fun, you're having fun right? And uh, in my house, um, we say this. Okay, you, 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 hopefully, you can relate to this. Have you ever been, you've had one of those days, this like the perfect day. They all can't be perfect, but you've had that perfect day. Maybe it was on vacation, and on vacation, you are... Uh, you've got up, you felt good when you got up. Praise you, Jesus, when we get up, feel good. Um, the coffee was just right. You had your favorite breakfast. You were at the beach. Everybody you love was around you. And it was just one long, beautiful day. And you watched the sunset on that day. And my wife and I will say things like this together. Wouldn't it be great if every day was this day? Right? How wonderful it would be if every day was this day. But the truth of the matter is they, they all can't be that day. In fact, if there was uh, no bad, we probably wouldn't know what was good. And uh, so uh, I can say time flies when you're having fun, whether you're aged or not. When good things are happening and those wonderful days are kind of strung together, time just flies. Another thing we can agree on is this. When you're having one of the worst days of your life, or you're in one of the worst seasons of your life. Uh, you wake up, you don't feel good because you are sick. You're chronically uh, sick. Uh, things have not worked out with your business or your job or your relationships or all those things. But you're in the midst of a real testing of your life. Well, we wish to God times would fly then, right? Lord, help me get on through this day. So maybe there's at least a promise and hope for another day that might be better than this lousy day or this lousy season uh, in our life. So uh, if you put yourself in this first century Christian's footsteps right here, and by the way, the human experience is going to be by and large the same in a lot of ways, but boy, for them... Uh, they're being abused and beat up by the world and so forth. I mean, when Peter said uh, all things, the end of all things is at hand, that didn't sound too bad to them. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. That'd be just fine, right? Um, I love when you go ahead and get into verse 12 there on your, on your, in your Bible. And I love the word Peter chooses to start this section uh, in verse 12 in the very first word there, beloved. Beloved. 
he's given them some hard news. By the, by the way, beloved is agapatos in Greek. Uh, some of you might hear the root word agape. There are three primary words for love in the Greek, and agape is the one always associated uh, with God. For God agape the world. It is a deep abiding love that is there. And, you know, we just say love. I love hot dogs. I love my truck. I love my dog. I love my wife. There ought to be a variation of something in the middle of that. Another one of those Greek words just for the interest of it is phileo. And it's, it's a brotherly kind of love. And that's where Philadelphia gets its name from the Greek phileo, Philadelphia. And not much brotherly love in the streets of Philadelphia these days, but uh, nonetheless, there's actually seven Greek words describing love. They're very detailed in that. But this word that Peter used, this beloved, this agapatos, is, is a word, uh, as you see on the screen, describes the love of another. This is a love being called out of the giver's heart by the preciousness of the recipient of that love. You are so precious to me, beloved. You, do you see it? Uh, think of the most precious person to you in the world. That's your beloved. Uh, my wife, April, is my beloved. Uh, you, you would use those words. And it's interestingly enough, the first seven times it's used in Scripture, it is God talking about his son, Jesus. This is my beloved son, he says in Matthew. I, I am well pleased. Listen to him. The first seven times it's used was God himself talking about uh, about Jesus in that. So it's, a, it's an endearing term. Uh, with that said, remember the context now. Peter is addressing exiled Christians who are suffering unimaginable heartaches and hard trials. And by the way, I'm speaking about trials tonight. Exiles in the midst of trials. I think something like that was my title. Anybody in a trial tonight? We are in church for crying out loud. Come on now, slip up your hand. I'm, I'm in a trial tonight. I don't mean your own trial. <laughs> but that could be another kind of trial, right? Uh, many hands that are, that are up uh, with that. So these particular people are, they're suffering unimaginable heartaches, hard trials. And these things have happened to them. And here, I, I want to be very careful and the bulk of the message is going to be this and we'll circle back around in a second. The trial that they're in is not a result of their sin. The trial that they're in is a result of the sinful world in which they live in. These people are righteous people who live in a broken, sinful world that is turned against them. And they're being beat up by just because they're being followers of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, when you're experiencing such hard difficulties, our emotions sometimes can take over. Man, I'm saying, if you're in a trial tonight, you, you need to get your pen out and write a few things down tonight. When you're in a trial, what happens? My emotions take over. And I forget what I should know. And I forget what I should remember because my emotions get in charge. And I forget who I am, how beloved I am by God. I forget my purpose. And I get all out of sync with all the things that I should be well understanding but emotions take over and I begin to question all kinds of stuff I question God I question other people around me uh, in my life and we're tempted to quit because our emotions have taken over and it is, it is um, that fear and, and fly right okay I, I'm, I'm now I'm scared to death I don't know what to do I'm just going to flee uh, we're reminded sometimes in things like this, or we should be reminded of, of Job's wife and her encouraging words when Job sat down in the ash heap and he had lost everything. All of his wealth is gone and he's scraping his own sores from the sickness that he has. And then Job's wife steps out with those very encouraging words. Do you remember them? Why don't you just curse God and die? <laughs> right? Why don't you just let time fly? Get it over with, Job. You must have done something. I mean, my goodness, look at all the things that have befallen you. We don't know why it all happened. And many of the t times in our life, we don't know why things happen. But you don't let the emotions take over. You, go, you get the Word of God and anchor yourself with that so you know what's true. 
I, I don't know how many phone calls I have set on listening to my wife give advice to someone who's called her. And I don't hardly ever think to use this, but she uses it all the time. And that is write down what you know to be true. You're going through a hard time. Write down what you know to be true because right now you're questioning everything true in your life. And that's a good way to start when you're walking through a, a trial. So Peter uses here beloved as a descriptive title, reminding his readers who are going through much suffering and loss because of persecution that they were not to trust their feelings. Please get a hold of that. Do not trust your feelings, but to remember rather that you are loved by the very heart of God. He loves you right where you are. There's no way God could love you more than he loves you right now. And it's not based on what you're doing or not doing. He just loves. Uh, that's what agape love means. It's a, a love without an expectation of return of that love. In other words, I will die for you and you can reject me and still go to hell and he says, I'll still love you. You can curse me in this earth, but I still love you enough, I'll die for you. What kind of love? Wow. So beloved, now watch now. In verse 12, next, next word, next phrase, do not be surprised. Surprised is the word uh, senzio, senzio. All right, what does it mean? It means not bring previously known, something unfamiliar, causing wonder or astonishment. Peter is using here a command that in English we would just call it a, a present imperative, which when combined with a negative not implies that you're not to be surprised when you have a trial as a Christian. And what do all Christians do pretty much when they have a trial? Oh my goodness. I was told when I got saved, I would not have any more trouble. If, if somebody told you that, they lied. And they're just dumb. You will have trials the rest of your life. You can do them with God or without God. That's, that's how that works. But you're going to have trials. And so he's saying here, stop thinking it's such a strange thing. Stop. You hear it? Stop being surprised when you have a fiery trial that you're going through. As you see it in verse 12, because this is what you're going to have. So what you need to do is stop and pull back and... Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen. Sometimes you can have things that fall upon you that are so tough, it'll almost break your jaws to say those words. The problem about being a pastor is you know what's right. And when trials fall into my life, I know what's right. But you know what? I do some of the same things you do. Golly, Dad, I'm shocked that this is happening. <laughs> really, Lord? Lord, are you kidding? <laughs> Cancer? Really? Stage four? What in the world? I'm seeing my oncologist yesterday. My blood pressure's through the roof. He looks at me. He, he knows what this is about. He said, man, why is your blood pressure so high right now? He said, I said, because I'm looking at you. <laughs> I said, dude, I like you, but I get PTSD when I see your face. <laughs> Few people ever have hurt me like you've hurt me, right? What do you do when a trial hits you? Somewhere gather your good sense and realize that nothing has come into your life that God didn't allow. Amen. For some of you with different persuasions, let me help you with this. What kind of theology do you believe that Satan could actually slip something in and give you cancer or strike you with some other kind of disease or cause whatever into your life? And God looks down from heaven and goes, I did not. He just caught me off guard. I didn't know that Satan was going to attack him that way. By the way, those of you who are sick, 
you know how this is everybody comes up and says put this oil under your tongue right drink this potion and the others are going to read this book it's an attack from Satan or you just, you just tell that cancer or that whatever it is in your life that you just rebuke that cancer it's not there and you know what people tell me that and I go no it's there <laughs> it really is there and I'll tell you why it's there because God allowed it to be there everything that happens in your life if you'll come around to a place of just stop and realize if, it, if you're dealing with it in this kind of a trial God thank you God thank you in all circumstances you give thanks and you hold on to the promise of Romans 8 28 if we know that for those who love God all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose I feel like I'm called according to his purpose so Lord whatever you're doing praise the Lord so what's happened to you is not strange now listen specifically in this subject we're talking about trials because you are a Christian the health trial I'm talking about does not hit you because of that God can use that to enhance things in your life we'll talk about it as we get done tonight but if you're being persecuted because you've made a stand for the Lord Jesus or you're just following the Lord and doing what you've always done in doing so the Lord reminds us in John chapter 15 beginning of verse 18 if the world hates you know that it has hated me before it hated you if you were of the world the world would love you as its own because you're not of the world but I chose you out of the world by the way when he saves you he's choosing you step up out of the world quit living worldly therefore the world hates you and they'll malign you when you do certain things when you don't go to the party anymore when you don't do the things you used to do well they'll hate you for it remember the word that I said to you a servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me they will persecute you Peter knew it all too well didn't he I want to point out once again that specifically speaking we're specifically speaking about a trial that is brought on our lives because we are Christians All right, uh, this is not normal trials we're facing day to day however there are many people here in, in, in America now we see it on the news some of us have experienced it ourselves uh, there is certain kinds of trials that are coming into our life and they're only going to increase because it's later than it's ever been and Jesus said it's going to increase until he arrives back but I, I've spoken on this so many times previously but it just merits being said again if you don't think the world hates Jesus just bring his name up where you work just tell everybody where you work how much you love him whether it's a small group or a large group or, or doing whatever and this has been around forever I, I remember my wife owned a uh, we bought a, a a franchise real estate franchise years ago we were both uh, both of us had real estate license we were 18 years old my, my parents were uh, realtors back in the day and we had a national um, company that April owned and was the broker and I'm talking about early 20s and I'm a, I just started our church in Arkansas and they had a big meeting and they thought how wonderful we'll ask the, the pastor to pray over uh, the start of this function they were having and a little lady come up to me and she said pastor but we, we just don't want you to mention the name of Jesus when you pray and I said well you can count on me <laughs> dear Lord Jesus thank you Jesus <laughs> in Jesus name amen, amen. To, to get done with it and you know what happened people in that room applauded when I got done praying because they'd heard all that nonsense too and say well now that lady didn't want to sit with me after all that but you know that's the way it is there's if you stand up for Jesus at the business deal on the ball team or somewhere most often times it's going to be met with some resistance this is a universal truth when I say this I, I'm, I, all of you attend here regularly you know this I, I'm as country as field corn and y'all know that 
I've spent a lot of time in barns, hay barns, milk barns, all that kind of stuff. When you go in at daylight, I've seen it in Australia, I've seen it in Europe, and I've sure seen it in Arkansas where I grew up. You start going in the barn for daylight, and you hit the, the switch on the wall or the breaker, and you throw on all the lights, two things simultaneously happen. The birds begin to sing, and the rats run. <laughs> Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. When you turn the light on, you'll find out where people stand. You mention the light of Jesus Christ, the rats will run, and those who know him will start singing. Yeah, oh, they'll, they'll gather up around. They'll tell me more about him. Jesus, I'm the light of the world, but men love darkness rather than light. Yeah. That, that's what they love. Uh, listen to us. It, Jesus, 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 he's the, it's the sweetest name I know, right? It, the, the, there's something about that name, Master, Savior, you guys know that. Like the fragrance after the rain. I mean, we, we love Jesus. Amen. But, ever, man, you get around some people and say, I don't want to hear that name. You can talk about anybody but that name. So, again, Peter is saying, stop being caught off guard and being surprised by this. It's a tale as old as time. Yes. The first boy is on the planet. Cain hated Abel because Abel loved God. And his offering was accepted by God and Cain's was not because he didn't do what he was asked to do. And what did he do? Did he repent? No, he just killed his brother. Jesus warned his own disciples in Matthew 10, 17, Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues. The places you're supposed to worship God, they're going to they're going to actually do it right there. Some of the disciples were actually beaten and scourged in the very temple of God on the temple mount. Peter was one of those. Peter, who's writing this, knew all about that. You read it in Acts chapter 5 in verse 40 and 41. And when they, that they is the Sanhedrin, had called in the apostles, Peter was one of those in that number that day, they beat them <laughs> and charged them not to speak in the name of who? And then they let him go. And then they left the presence of the council, speaking of the apostles, and they rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Wow. Peter's saying, think it not strange. Listen, he told us that, and it wasn't but a few months, and they, they whipped my tail up, up in the temple mount. Peter could open up his shirt and show you his back and the scars and he can say to the first century believers, do not be surprised when this happens to you. Do not be surprised. Here's what Peter is saying in this section of verses. This will just help it, particularly for you guys in, in life groups here. These verses are outlined this way. When you suffer a trial as a Christian, verse 12, he's saying, expect it. Don't be surprised by it, but expect it. And then verse 13, rejoice in it. Rejoice now, and you can rejoice later. And they practiced that, right? They took that beating, and then they rejoiced. They, they were found worthy to take one. And then uh, number three, know you'll be blessed and have his spirit upon you. In verse 14, if you're going to suffer in Jesus' name, he says, my spirit is going to come upon you in a special way. The fourth thing is intelligent. Evaluate why you are suffering, and do not be ashamed. Verse 15 and 16. Number five, understand that judgment begins first with God's church. Please know that. So quit being surprised because he intends for you to have some suffering. It's going to happen to us first. Understand it's going to happen. The world's judgment is then coming. It's coming later. Verse 17. Or, and then lastly, entrust your soul to God and keep doing what is right no matter the cost. Verse 19. So all that is rolled out through there. Back in verse 12, the imagery of fire, this fiery trial that you may be going through is often applied to testing or persecution, even in our modern conversation. When somebody's really going through something, what do we say? Oh man, he's really going through the fire, right? 2,000 years removed, we're still talking about that. Oh man, they're walking through the fire. I started to make the title uh, Fire Walkers. Uh, he's really going through the fire. It's a typical statement to describe someone experiencing personal difficulties. 
They're really going through it right now. Going through what? Going through, they're going through a trial. They're going through a difficulty. In the Old Testament, interestingly enough, fire was a symbol of holiness. A symbol of holiness and, and, and of God and the presence of God. Remember how, what, what was always the symbol? There's this fire. How, what did they follow going through the, uh, the wilderness? I'm talking about the children of Israel as they were leaving Egypt as a pillar of, of fire. Is God's presence in that. And the fire on the altar, what does it do? It consumes the sacrifice. So is it holiness about that? Listen to a few of these quotes. G. Campbell Morgan, pastor of yesteryear, it is a very remarkable thing that the church of Christ persecuted has been the church of Christ pure. The church of Christ patronized has always been the church of Christ impure. When all things are just great and wonderful. By the way, that's the whole message of last week, right? If you're going through some difficulties and you believe that the end of all things is at hand, you ought to have some weight in your prayer life. If you're not going through a trial, usually your prayer is not that great. But your prayer life ticks up when you're sick as unto death or you're really walking through some hardship in your life. And boy, then your prayer life ticks up, right? Have some weight to it. Same with the church. The fastest growing church on the planet Iran, China, anywhere the church is heavily persecuted as unto death, the church is growing exponentially. And it's always been that way. When God allows his own church to experience persecution and fiery trials, the true church is going to flourish. A false or counterfeit church is going to fold under it. It's going to fold. Listen, uh, little dandelion Christians are going to just fall out. They're going to go home. Well, I don't have time to chase all that stuff. <clears throat> There's a lot of people that I'll meet, and they'll, they'll say, well, you know, I just got burned out. There ought to be some self-evaluation with that. Because what you're saying would imply that you used to be on fire. If you've never been on fire for God, I don't know how you burn out. Some people hadn't even smoldered. Hadn't been a spark, hadn't been anything. And the truth of the matter is, they got their feelings hurt. Something didn't go right in the business meeting. Somebody said something to me. Oh, God help us to stand in front of people who have been burned at the stake in Christ's name, and we quit because we got our feelings hurt. Warren Wiersbe speaks of God's refining process in the furnace of afflictions, noting that God has never promised that we would miss the storm, but he has promised that, he would, that we would make it to the harbor. When God puts his own people into the furnace, he keeps his eye on the clock and his hand on the thermostat. He knows how long and how much. Amen. Charles Spurgeon, God had one son without sin, and he never had a son without a trial. So quit being surprised because if you are God's son or daughter, you are going to have a trial. And I, this is what I've learned. Some are just really building up to a bigger one. He can't give you the biggest one because that would crush you out. You got to build up to him. John Huss, the Bohemian Christian reformer, was burned at the stake in 1415. The year 1415. Before his accusers lit the fire, they put a paper crown on his head that had pictures of little devils dancing around on it. To mock him, they put the little hat on him. He answered their mockery by saying, My Lord Jesus Christ, for my sake, wore a crown of thorns. Why should not I then, for his sake, wear this light crown? Be it ever so enigmous. Truly, I will do it willingly. And after the wood was stacked up to his neck... And they said, if you'll denounce your Christianity, you can live. Boy, that's right there at it, isn't it? Wood to the neck and a little crown of devils on your head. Huss replied, in the truth of the gospel which I preach, I die willingly and joyfully today. The wood was ignited and the Huss died while singing. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, have mercy on me and them. Amen. In song. I'll take a few minutes tonight as we just 
walk out this message and just talk about trials because there's lots of trials but I'm, to simplify it I'm going to just make three categories all right uh, the first one is just I'm going to call the trials of life trials of life the human experience there are some trials you have just because you're a human being living in a broken world is that fair enough trials of life um, you're going to face these things we live in a fallen world where things just happen cars get wrecked um, houses burn down just difficulty uh, I believe in the sovereignty of God as I just said some things are not easily explained some things we're never going to be able to explain we're just going to get it in heaven and we won't even need it when we get to heaven it won't matter but bad things sure do happen in a fallen world would you agree uh, bodies get sick different things uh, here's the, some of the trials we have in common in this human experience when I say that it's, it's universal wherever you go uh, there's relational trials hard to get along in your own house can I get a witness or an old me or something right hard to get along in our own house let alone country to country right let alone in our own county let alone in our own church everybody can't be right but everybody can think they're right what does it take in, a, in the church house to get along spirit filled people spirit filled people most of your new testament has been written to the church to know how to get along why because we have a hard time getting along the evidence of the filling of the Spirit of God is not necessarily all the religious stuff most people think that it is. Spirit-filled people are loving, compassionate, helpful, willing to serve, willing to come early and stay late. They'd rather meet a need than have a need met in them. They're easy to be with. They're not anxious. They're not rattled easily. And listen to this one. They can take a punch. They can take a punch. They're kind and they're gracious and they're joyful and they're full of God's mercy and wisdom. Those are not uh, those who are not filled with the Spirit of God are the exact opposite of what I just said. They're the exact opposite, and they're always blaming somebody else for everything wrong in their life. Who can I sue or who can I accuse or who can I blame this on? they just can't even get along you heard about that guy that was on that deserted island for all those years and he got rescued and when the rescuers got to him they saw the, the, they saw the three little buildings little huts that he had built and they said what are these he said well this one was my house and he said what is this one he said this is where I went to church and they said what's the other one he said that's where I used to go to church there are other kind of trials that we have in the human experience if you live long enough you'll experience most of these uh, that is failing finances job loss businesses that go up and down sometimes it's your doing sometimes it's things that have nothing to do many people have lost their business with all the right business practices but the government changed inflation came uh, prices uh, happened industry changed you did everything right and it still went upside down what is that it's the human experience it's just what it is then there's failing health hello <laughs> anybody experiencing failing health I got my compression socks on just went and picked them up before church started first ones I ever had in my life I slipped them on and I got so tired slipping them on I had to rest it's God's truth got, got blood clots got stuff you know it's just fun I had someone contact from my hometown and asked me to send them football memorabilia and track stuff because they're opening up a restaurant and sent to me and my wife said we got to have some Roy Mack stuff in here 
And I thought about that. I thought, man, I used to be, a, I used to be like one of the fastest athletes in my state. And now I'm wearing compression socks for crying out loud. <laughs> and I'm more excited about supper than I am anything else tonight with that. So we get sick from the food we eat, the air we breathe, the people that we're around. We're going to have failing health. Good. And then, boy, there's the third one. <laughs> Statistics on dying. Phew, strong. Y'all know the answer to that. You can't live on earth without the expectation that one day, well, you just get to die. And ever so often, you'll meet someone who's bitter, and they're using this whole idea that somebody died in their life to why they don't want to serve God anymore. Well, my dad died, or my brother died, or my mom died. And listen, there's untimely things that happen. A child dies, that's untimely. I don't understand all, I don't. Don't ask me to explain it, I don't know. We'll just have to get before God one day and get it all worked out. But I know this, eventually everybody's going to die. And for the very reason somebody has an excuse is the very reason we better just stay at it. We're all going to die. Everyone's mother and father will die. We will die. It's the cost of living in a fallen world where all of us are sinners and the wages of sin is our death. So that is why we're given a redeemer, by the way. The world is not all there is. This world on our best day. Remember that day I talked about? I wish all days were this day. That won't even be an appetizer in eternity. Right? That won't even be an appetizer in eternity. That will all be the best day. The, the day that doesn't end. Eternity is what we are made for. You are here to make a decision whether to know him or reject him. And when you receive him, then you're to help other people know him. Remember, Jesus tasted death for all mankind. He died for in all of our places. He's the conqueror of death and the grave and hell. And he says, I hold the keys to death and hell. I'm their daddy. They're powerless over me. Paul would say, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Death is just a sting and it's over. And the grave has no victory over us as followers of the one who is the master of it. So again, in this life, we have trials. And they're common to mankind. Common to mankind. Would you agree? There's relational trials, health trials, failing bodies, ultimately death. We're promised by God when we get to heaven. Wow. No more misunderstandings. <laughs> Pure relationships, right? Why don't she get me? Right? Why don't she understand? I don't know. Well, in heaven, no more misunderstanding, no more tears, no more pain, no more guilt or shame because our sins are forgiven. And we're promised new bodies. There's no more sickness, no more failing health. There'll be no more death. It's all redeemed by the Redeemer. There's another kind of trial. I'm going to go quick. The trials of sowing and reaping. And that's just the passive judgment of God, which I talked about some weeks ago. You sow something, you reap something. In somebody's life, they sow nothing good in their life. They just sow thistles and thorns and the seeds of all that stuff. And when it comes up, they're just shocked. Well, I don't know why all these bad things are happening to me. If you'll see me after class, I'll explain it. <laughs> right? You live like a rebel for years. I, April and I are speaking in a, a marriage conference in a few weeks uh, down in Columbus and about nearly 100 couples and we had them fill out a survey and I'm reading it and I get cracked up because it's the same stuff, that relational stuff. I don't know why she don't get me. She don't, he don't know why she don't follow. Right? It's just this great big mystery that is there. And the, see, the first thing I have to say when I get to a two-day meeting like that, my wife and I, is to say, I can't fix in two, four sessions all that you've sown in bad in 20 years yeah, or 30 years or five years. But we can start putting different seeds in the ground and expecting some different stuff to come up. I mean, you think about it. Somebody will live a life of crime. A life of crime, get caught, get put in jail, and who they blame first? God, why did you let this happen to me? Somebody may need to hear this. 
is it fair if you smoke two packs a day and it says right on the package these things will kill you and then you get sick and blame God that you're sick when you've been so and 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 and God says it's just the passive judgment of God you can't try to kill yourself for 30 years and then be mad at God when the crop comes up so past you being cruel no I'm trying to help somebody put that thing out for the last time and leave it alone a lot of relational stuff that's there we talked about it last week somebody starts sowing little seeds of flirtation here and there and all of a sudden the crop comes up in a temptation of which one can't bear and then maybe after all of it has got in the fan and went all over the wall there's some real repentance but you know it take a long time to clean that up you got consequences God can forgive it all and he will the minute you repent but you have consequences to walk up out of and it may take years to do it if you spend constantly more than you make you heard it here first you're going to have a financial trial if you take more than you give and you develop that kind of a spirit you're going to be hard to be around because they're, giving people are wonderful people but stingy people are hard to be around anyway I think you got enough of that one you reap what you sow did Jesus say that <clears throat> here's the last kind of trial and it is the very subject we're talking about here the trials that God sovereignly orchestrates into our lives to test our faith whether you're standing up for him and God allows there to be persecution or he just lets some health issue happen or some, something enters your life and you realize it's not because of a lifestyle you were, you were found faithful and now you're just dealing with something and it is man it might be the trial of your life here's one of the reasons it is to show you what you have God knows what you have but you need to know what you have it is here to test your metal. He knows your heart, but you need to know your heart. Will you really fold when times get tough? You need to know that. You should know that. I'm familiar with one or two of these kind of things. God just sends into your life, and it just tests your metal. And it'll firm up what you really believe, and it will literally strip out a lot of stuff that doesn't matter. And all that is what I would just say a good thing that you ought to thank God for. I've read a few books recently, one in the past month, that had a lot to do with uh, our, our Navy SEALs and just special forces training and so forth. Just, just some interesting things to me. Uh, somebody gave me one from a guy that, that um, was just a little younger than me and lived in an area of Arkansas where I'm from and I'm reading his story and I thought I've eaten that restaurant I've been to this place I've done this and so I was greatly interested in it um, and you know how it is if you want to be a part of the Navy SEALs all you got to do is just go down to the Navy recruiting office and knock on the door they'll let you in and tell them I want to be a SEAL and I, oh that's no problem at all and they'll give you a couple of swimming lessons and let you run an obstacle course and, and you know, uh, just pin a trident on you. And, and then, you know, about three or four weeks from then, you can just be sent to a special ops operation. Even if you're an idiot, you know that's not true. <laughs> we know that's not how it works. They're going to literally try to crush you to little pieces for months and months and months. It's really years. I'm talking about crush you into little pieces like they could just sweep up into a dustpan and just toss you away. You got to go through the regular military stuff where they're going to try to crush you to pieces and then they're going to only get you really selected, uh, you know, double good handful to go in 
to try to be uh, into the seals and they're going to try to crush you run you, drill you, threaten to kill you, threaten to drown you you'll think they're drowning you let you pass out, bring you back to life put you back in and do it again just the truth and then if you've not quit by then they'll take you through what they call hell week where some of the toughest of men cry and tap out then they're going to train you some more they're going to train you with weapons train you in the water train you jumping out of airplanes and down ropes out of helicopters and how to clear a room with weapons with all kinds of people trying to kill you while you're doing it in dozens of different ways why do they train like that? you know what SEALs stand for? sea, air, and land because they want to send you somewhere whether you go by sea or ride by uh, uh, air or come by land you are prepared to go anywhere any way anytime to do anything and when you get there what you're going to know is I'm the toughest man and nothing I'm going to face is going to be better than what I've already gone through you guys good with that by undergoing the grueling regimen of sleepless days and nights and sensory overload and the physical training these recruits are transformed into some of the toughest human beings on the planet at Coronado Naval Amphibious Base in San Diego they push those men to the brink of insanity and they punish their bodies to the point far past cruelty I mean you can't read it and go how would that not be cruel I was trying to read some of this to my wife the other day and she said it stresses me you just can't read this to me anymore she couldn't, she couldn't even hear it but I'm going to tell you one of them <laughs> one of the last swims like a mile or two through, got to get out through the surf all those waves crashing in get out a mile or two and then four or five miles down the, down the beach swimming oh by the way why are you carrying a sledgehammer and your team has got a, a rucksack that you're handing off and swimming with a doggone sledgehammer <laughs> holy man I'm just blown away every time I think of it watch now so they are tested they are tested listen to me so they'll know what they're about because they're going to be sent in places against all odds. They've got to slip in, fight their way out, be the baddest people on the planet. And no, I'm not going to face anything out here that they hadn't already tried to kill me with before. It's a whole mindset that they go out with. You've got to know you're a firewalker and not a quitter to be in that part of it. So God is making some of you into special forces. He wants to be able to send you anywhere, anytime, and you be able to be his witness. By the way, the root word for witness is the same word for martyr. Something in you has to really die. And here's what's got to die. You. Your pride and your self-sufficiency. All that's got to go away so you're willing to not care what somebody else actually thinks and get over your own embarrassment to be able to stand up for Jesus anytime, anywhere. <laughs> sea, land, or air. He strips you of all that stuff and leaves you humble. By the way, one of the marks of a Navy SEAL, humility. Isn't that surprising? I was with some guys who were Navy SEALs a few years ago and some, <laughs> some young ladies asked them, so what do Navy SEALs do? The guy literally goes, we just do seal stuff. <laughs> just left it right there. No bragging, no, well, we do this and that. No, just, we just do seal stuff and change the subject. <laughs> has God give you some things through the years that has stripped some stuff out of you and got rid of that self-sufficiency and dinged up your pride? and left you humble don't let the sun set any further on this day that you don't give God thanks for that I do not like trials more than the next guy 
but I can look back on so much in my life and say thank you Jesus for all of it that went through my life because they made me more like him and last time I checked that's the goal we are to be more like him and there is fellowship in his suffering <clears throat> last verses James writes his letter also to the exiles those who are scattered in dispersion just like Peter's talking about it's mirror verses by the way it's a place in scripture you just know these go together James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. In other words, just various things you go through. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and that let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Perfect means lacking in nothing, not perfect, sinless. But I have what I need to do what he's called me to do because he's equipped me by giving me trials. Verse 12, if you went down into the chapter. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive a crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. You handle your trials right that God gives you. God says there's a crown in heaven for that, but not for quitters. Amen. Not for quitters. So you want the bottom line? Don't quit, don't you dare quit do not dare quit whatever you're going through just remember you're going through not to through Amen. and you will come out on the other side if he'll let, let him have his perfect work in your life and you'll be better off that you did Amen. Jesus <clears throat> walked through the trial he didn't quit he went all the way to the cross so you and I could go all the way to heaven Amen. troubles and trials are meant to drive us to God or back to God to his word to prayer to his body his church watch now if your trial is driving you away from God away from this book and away from prayer and away from his church you're about to quit and lots of people are running from God who sit in chairs and never miss but you're not doing what God's called you to do and God will get your attention. Be better off you surrender yourself to God and let him have his way in you than have to crush you through some other kind of trial because he wants you to be like him and being like him is not being a quitter or just being lukewarm and mundane. It doesn't matter if you're here or not because you're a zero in the kingdom of God. But when you get where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing, Listen, God can do great things with you. So what is your trial doing for you is the question. All of us are going to have them. So what's it doing in you? How's it working? What's happening in you? How you respond to this is going to be highly, highly important. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes just a few moments. With our heads bowed and eyes closed. How you doing with that trial? How you doing with that trial? Listen, so many of you are probably in so many different spots and places and going through so many different things. Let's just acknowledge it this way tonight. If you believe the Spirit of God, not the preacher getting all emotional, but the Spirit of God has used His Word tonight to touch something in your life that your heart needs to respond to, would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, I believe that's me. Man, it's most of us. You may put your hands down. It's most of us. What would happen if all of us just got where we're supposed to be as we walk through this trial right now? What would your family be like? What would this church be like? What would the community be like if that were to happen? If you slipped up your hand, you would know what to do. Just begin to pray and surrender yourself. Some of you need to thank God for a trial and quit complaining about that trial. Just start thanking God for that trial right now. Thank God that he's stripping you of your self-sufficiency and he's, he's humbling you. And some of you are in a ditch so deep, nobody can get you out but God. So just thank him for that. Maybe you're here tonight and you don't know Christ as Savior. 
a whole nother matter. I just want you to know where you're sitting that God can meet you right there. How did Peter start this chapter out or this section of scripture out? Beloved, he loves you. He loves you. He'll love you and let you reject him. But he'd certainly rather you receive him as Savior. Do you know him as Savior? Meaning, if you were to die tonight, do you know heaven's your home? If he were to come before you got to your car to leave tonight, is he coming for you? Here's what you got to know. You got to know that he loves you, but you got to know that you're a sinner. The reason Jesus died was to pay for mine and your sin. He died in our place. He died as a substitute. The scriptures tell us that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Calling on him is, God have mercy on me. Forgive me of my sin. I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ. Asking him to be my savior. I repent of my sin. I surrender my life. If you need help wording a prayer like that and you need to be saved, you don't have to pray out loud, but out of your heart, would you just pray after me a prayer like that? I'll pray again for you. You just pray it out of your heart behind me. Dear God, I do believe that you love me. I confess I'm a sinner. I do believe that you, Jesus, died in my place, that you died for my sin. The very best I know how, I ask you to be my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. I surrender my life to you. I ask this by faith. And I ask this in Jesus' name.